Apple Show, take two. Uh, we are live on the internet for really real, and this episode is 48, and we're presumably going to last more than the 50 seconds our last attempt uh, managed to get. Uh, so here we are. Welcome to the Virtual Mobile Show. I am your host, a very discombobulated Dieter Bone. I'm Vlad Savo. I'm Dan Seifert. And for the second time, I'm Chris Sigler. <laughs> And I don't even know, man. If you ever yeah. want to throw Dieter off his game, make him do two intros to two different mobile <laughs> shows within five make, minutes. Make me do two intros and tell me I'm live on air when I don't know if I'm live on air, and I can't. I think I'm going on air in the midst of me going on air. That's okay. We're um we're very grateful to uh, our our podcast video podcast producers. Uh, they're the best, and uh, I have no complaints. Uh, so here we are, and we've got a week's worth of mobile news. And, um, you know, I kind of went on a giant WebOS rant today on Twitter. You really did. You yeah, really I think I'm done. About this. I think I'm over it. I think it's... No, we past. should fire it back up right here and now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you I want think, me to get angry about? The fact that well, I, I have I want to know a... what... what... Okay. What, what led you to pull out a, a veer over the weekend <laughs> and use it? So, uh, we're, you know, it's Memorial Day weekend, and I, I don't have much for life. So we spent the weekend, like, putting together deck furniture and, like, cleaning out the apartment. And my bike, which I had left on the balcony, uh, had rusted out. And so I took that to Goodwill, just cleaning stuff out. And we've got, like, four veers in the closet. It's like, oh, hey, this veer is really cool. I, it's so small. It's so cute. I mean, look at look at this thing. It's so little and cute and... Amazing. Anyway, um, my voice is like high pitched, like when you see a puppy for the first time, which is how the veer makes me feel. It's like a cute little puppy um, <laughs> that died in its sleep. Um, it was it was murdered in its sleep. Anyway, it's such a small phone. In my head, I'm like, oh well, this obviously takes a uh, micro sim, so I'm going to put a sim in this card to activate it because you can't activate a WebOS device out of the box without a sim unless it's the touchpad. Um, so I'm like, oh, okay, cool, stick the SIM in here. Oh, wait, no, it takes a full-size SIM. This tiny, itty-bitty little phone takes a full-size SIM card, uh, or whatever. <laughs> what's, what's it called, Dina, Chris? It has an HP logo it's on a mini it. SIM, yeah. so you... It's a mini-SIM. It's a mini-SIM, takes a mini-SIM, the quote-unquote yeah. full-size. Anyway, uh, so my SIM card got completely stuck in it. So obviously the thing to do is take it apart and see if I can get the SIM out. Um, and iFixit does not have a teardown for this, but WebOS Internals does, so I went there and took the phone apart and was not able to get the SIM card out without completely destroying the Veer, uh, which made me sad, um, but now I'm on a, a kick of activating all my WebOS devices and trying them again, and remembering how awesome certain parts of it is, like the fact that you can have multiple cards per app, so I can have a Twitter app with a list card open for uh, my list of Verge editors and my main timeline. I can have an IRC app open that works better than any IRC app in any other mobile device, period, and have cards for each room. Um, you know, you root it by typing in the Konami code. There's just so much that was good about it, and um, a lot well, of the good bad. news. I mean, the good news, <laughs> Dieter, the good news, Dieter, is that uh, LG is going to keep the dream alive for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> TVs, guys. <laughs> Really want to see. Think about how many cards you can have on a TV. So many cards. cards. You can have a card for each channel. Yeah, that's actually not a bad idea. I like that. I'm sure that's exactly what they're doing. Card for each channel, and they'll be able to stack them together, swipe them away. It'll all work with giant gestures. (laughs) Yeah, use your remote to activate the gestures. Look out. (laughs) Um. I, I, I don't know. I could go on, but I'm... I'm you're really you're kind of inspiring me, Dieter, because I want to go home and, and turn my Veer on and, and, and actually activate it. But, you know, the whole SIM card issue is going to be a problem for me, just like it was for Well, you. as long as you've got an adapter, it's fine, mostly. I, had, you know. <laughs> I still don't own a, uh, a Pre-3, which really breaks my heart. Yeah. You mean the Pre-3, like the one that's sitting on a touchstone on my desk right now with... Uh, exposition mode enabled, you know, two years before it came to Android and it's still not available on iOS where it displays ambient information while it's just sitting there on your desk charging. You mean that kind of Pre-3? That is exactly the kind of Pre-3 uh, that I'm talking about. And I'd be careful what you say, Peter, because I know where you live. Oh, <laughs> I'm, right. I'm, I'm not afraid, afraid to, uh, to burgle you 
for your pre three. <laughs> Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna find a way to pair up my pre three with my folio. I'm just it's gonna happen. This is Man. just such a wonderfully depressing so, way to start. Dieter, the you, need to, you need to pair up your pre three with a folio, and then mm -hmm. figure out somehow to link up a, a touchpad go to it, and it would just be like this trifecta of like rare palm devices. Fail. Yeah, <laughs> and then you could control the the whole thing with the uh, the IR port on some late model S sixty device, <laughs> oh, or, so or the nice. IR port on a Trio six fifty. Hang on, but the that S would be even better. Went to market in a way that mattered. This is very true. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, how about an N uh, an N nine fifty? Oh, there you go. That is a good call. See, now you're crossing yeah. the streams. This is not right. Now you're you're looking to control some Palm devices with this Nokia. Like, that's just... You should use another Palm device that has an IR port. There was plenty of them. Yeah, but they all got... The point is... Anyway. The point is to pick phones that, that were made but not released, or devices. Uh, we should move on to the news that actually matters. Has everybody, everybody seen, seen Six Fast, Six Furious, Six, six, six Times? Six times? Uh, um... Unfortunate. Well, is it out yet in the UK, Vlad? Oh, oh, it know. is, but I don't care about it that much. <laughs> wow! Shocking. Get, get off. Just, just hang up. <laughs> how, how do we? How do we kick him from the hangout? <laughs> What's the command? <laughs> well, Dan, so, shameless Dan. plug for Chris. He does have a an entire podcast dedicated to this topic, so we yes. do not need to dig into it. But it's I, uh, that's it's true. Fast yeah. Cast. yeah. It, it's called the Fast Cast. Uh, you can you can find it on my my personal blog, blog.zigglerc.net. Um, and uh, yeah, if you would like to really dive deep into the lore of the Fast and Furious universe, I highly recommend that you check it out. I gotta uh, say, I haven't seen two through five, and I felt like I missed nothing. Well, that's because you didn't see two through five. <laughs> like, if you, if you had seen two through five, you would know exactly what you were missing by not seeing two through five. Was I missing the fact that the quote unquote plot twist with the thing? I can't, I don't know. I don't know. Can we spoil it? No. There's a we, plot we better twist not spoil about, it. We better not. There's, There's not. a plot twist about 85% of the way through the movie, and I was just like, that, this plot twist means nothing. If they hadn't, like, told us instead of shown us a couple of things, which they did a lot in this movie, um, then I would have like it wouldn't have mattered at all. As it was, it was just like why why do I care about this this plot twist? I really just don't. Because you didn't see two through five. Okay, oh, wait, wait. Really? Okay. I, I got two points to make here. Uh, the first is that the assumption that you've missed something in two through five is an assumption that there's some substance to this movie series, <laughs> whereas there is no substance to it. Really, all it is, it's a manifestation of the demise of Anglo-American culture. The fact wow. that it's wow. number six. He just, he just called the Fast six, and the Furious guys. the downfall of Western civilization. Okay? It's a Listen, I, I just so that you, you all heard that, Vlad has called the Fast and the Furious the downfall of Western civilization. I came onto the show hat in hand. Literally, I'm holding a hat in my hand to apologize to Chris for having made so much fun of Fast and Furious over the years because I did <laughs> thoroughly enjoy myself no, thoroughly during the movie. Enjoy. And I, I mean, despite the, the the glaring potholes through which you could drive a giant Russian, uh, you know, cargo jet, and they did drive a giant <laughs> Russian cargo jet through those potholes, and then they drove a car through the jet Look, through the potholes. It the was Fa amazing. The Fast and the Furious represents everything that's great about seeing a movie in a theater. It's got lots of big explosions, really fast cars, and like. All the stuff that give you a good reason to go get out of your house and go to a movie theater to see it. It's not an art film that's going to make you think. It's not pushing the limits oh, of cinematography, that. but you know it's thoroughly enjoyable and it's just fun. I mean, I, I agree with everything you just said, Dan. Except I would challenge you on it not being an art film, <laughs> and I would challenge you on it not pushing the limits of cinematography. Other than that, I totally agree with everything that you just said. Okay, Se second point though. I, I, did, I did have a second point to make, which is that Chris is somebody who's watched the movie, and within the first five minutes of today's podcast, he was threatening Dieter with burglary. I mean, oh, that's true. The <laughs> cultural <laughs> impact here, it's, it's unmistakable. Oh, you should I'll, see I'll Chicago. It. You should see Ch Chicago, Vlad. It's just a complete, you know, overturned cars everywhere. I've just completely <laughs> laid the city. Riots and fires and <laughs> storefronts yeah, I mean, you know, smashed into. I'm sure Chris brought a Hummer on his way back from the movie. There, there's oh, yeah. no way 
he would have resisted. I, I, I've assembled uh, a team of miscreants to uh, to perform high value heists. I, <laughs> many many things have changed in my life since seeing this movie, but a team of former street racers who yep. can no, you current, know, current make street racer. current street racers who can make fast getaways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and also, uh, just anyway. just to point out, uh, there is a subtle influence to the things that we watch and thoroughly enjoy. As you guys, are you trying saying. to make? Are you trying to make a segue? Because I've been thinking of how to pull it off, and there's no way that we can at this point. Well, <laughs> the segue is I've got a point to make, so let me okay. make it. Um, a good example is uh, Jamie Oliver, who's a celebrity chef here in the UK, and he went over to the United States as well, and he's trying to. Uh, introduced better school meals in the UK, and he did an experiment in the US and stuff like that. So I watched those documentaries. I watched a few of them in a row. And the guy swears quite a bit, right? So one day, I watched a few of those documentaries, and the next day, I started randomly swearing. Uh, <laughs> and if you watch enough uh, sports people interviews, you find yourself a couple of hours later saying, you know a lot. So every sentence is, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's the VIA, so, you know. I mean... Uh, we tried to give 110%, you know. Vlad, so my favorite TV shows are, like, Mad Men, Game of Thrones, and then movies like The Fast and the Furious. And the last I checked, I'm, I'm not Don Draper, and I'm not beheading people, and I, I wish I had a faster car. Yeah, but see, you wish. <laughs> so so all, all that really means is that you're not acting it out. You, you're just repressed, which is another problem with Anglo-American culture. But seriously, uh, let's, let's do the segue where we completely openly admit that we're segueing to something mobile technology related, uh, which is, Dieter. Speaking of things that are completely American, because it's only available on Verizon, the Lumia 928. Boom! Done. <laughs> yes. Fast uh, segue well, ever. Well done. That was a very fast, very furious segue, and I, I appreciate <laughs> that, Dieter. Um, so I, I've been playing with the 928. It's in, I don't know if you can see it in my camera view. I'm not looking at myself right now. But um, I've been playing with the 928 for a while. You'll see the review up shortly. Um, it's, you know, I mean, I, I think that the the news of the phone and the specs of the phone very much tell the story of this phone, which is that it's a warmed over 920 uh, for Verizon. And it's, you know, that, that's a phone that Verizon needs. Um, the problem is that they needed it at the same time the 920 launched. Well, well hang on. Let's, let's rephrase that. Does Verizon need this phone or does Nokia need Verizon to need this phone? I think that Verizon, I mean, look, if, if well, it's, it's both. I think that Verizon... Uh, has a vested interest in um, being in lockstep with AT&T in terms of platform support and exclusives. Um, and the, CDMA carriers in general in the U.S. have been pretty weak on Windows Phone, and I think that that's not a good... Even though Windows Phone is not a particularly popular platform, it's not a good look for them. They need to be, they need to be right there alongside T-Mobile. You know, if AT&T has this sweet-looking, bright blue Lumia, Verizon, even if, it's, if it thinks it's only going to sell five of them, still needs one on, on its, uh, you know, in its portfolio, and they haven't but, had that. But Verizon doesn't have a sweet-looking, bright blue Lumia. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, so I'm, I'm getting to that, which is that they've kind of, in the process of taking this phone on, they've kind of de-beautified it. It's, um, and I don't know if that's Nokia's doing or Verizon's. I suspect it's a combination of both, and it might be specifically around the fact that they needed to skirt the exclusivity deal with at and I'm just speculating. I could be completely off base with that. But um, the phone is a lot more square than the 920, and it's only available in black and white, much like the 822, which I think, I mean, if Verizon is doing that, if Verizon is saying, look, you know, we, we don't want these crazy colors, just give us white and black, I mean, screw those guys. Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if Verizon is saying that, because if you look at the 8X, didn't Verizon have all the funky colors? It had blue and red and... Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, and it's not just the, that. The like, neon just yellow. Today, just today, uh, Verizon introduced a blue. I mean, it, it's pretty much turquoise, Razer HD and Razer RAM. So right. there's absolutely no color shyness in Verizon. 
Yeah, and, and they've, you know, historically they've done a lot of black and red phones, or black trimmed with red uh, in the droid range. So, yeah, the question becomes, why is this phone so boring looking, and why is it only available in black and white, uh, and, and just like the A22, and I don't have a good answer for that. The um, it, it looks, to, I mean, to me... Ever, do you ever feel like certain phone carriers, like, intentionally kind of break phones to... <laughs> From the start, like like they nerfed you know, it. Yeah, like 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 they nerfed it exactly. Like they they took what was a very hot looking, cool nine twenty, and they're like, you know, let's just make this a little more boring. We don't want to take attention away from the razor. Just, I absolutely just... think that's not a crazy theory, and I, I've heard from several sources over the past couple of years that there's still some residual heartburn from the Kin debacle, which <laughs> wow, which burned which burned Verizon for. Millions and millions of dollars burned Microsoft for more than that, but uh, but def- you know Verizon definitely got caught high and dry in that, and I think it strained their relationship with Microsoft, and that might have a lot to do that. That might explain to some degree why uh, Windows Phone's uh, CDMA support in general since the launch of Windows Phone Seven has been pretty weak. Because right, you know Verizon is you know that China excluded. Uh, Verizon is. A, I think probably the biggest CDMA carrier in the world, in a yeah. very very large market for any OEM to target. Um, and so yeah, we're just now getting this phone that's basically a warmed over 920, uh, except it doesn't look quite as good. Uh, it has a couple minor new features. It has, in my opinion, they're minor. It has a Xenon flash, which I used to think was a big deal, but now I'm realizing that flashes are stupid, and it, you really don't <laughs> like you yeah, know. Yeah. It, in a, in a perfect world, you want a sensor that's good enough so that you never need to be in a situation where you're using a flash. Like, a flash is like a, a, a last gasp effort to capture something that absolutely needs to be captured, and you're willing to accept the fact that the, that the outcome isn't going to be very good. Um, you know what doesn't and, have a flash? HP beer. <laughs> no flash. So true. So, e- I mean, to off, your, to your point, Chris, when, when Nokia introduced Xenon flashes years ago on its Symbian phones, the sensors that they were paired with were uh, much less sensitive than they are today. So it made right. much more... I mean, there was a lot of situations where you had to use a flash, and if you have to use a flash, the Xenon flash makes a lot more sense. But I guess what you're saying today is there's a lot of situations where you can get away with not using a flash, right? Right. And, and you know, just thinking back to even the 920, where... Nokia was really uh, trumpeting uh, the low light capabilities of that phone. This this phone has the same sensor, uh, 8.7 megapixels, if if, not, if I'm not mistaken. It's branded as a per, uh, pure view, and it does well in low light. Granted, it kind of like waves its hands a little bit to be good in low light. It it very very obviously is using a slow shutter speed, yeah. and um, it has very high noise reduction. So you end up with a, a really soft shot, even when something is perfectly in focus. Um, because it's it's trying to blur out all the noise that you're accumulating. So if you if you take a, a picture in low light with uh, the 928 uh, right next to the iPhone 5, you'll get a, a photo that's as bright out of the iPhone 5, but it'll be much noisier because the the noise reduction isn't as aggressive. Um, so so that's that's one thing the uh, the Xenon flash. The other difference, uh, which I just could not care less about, is that the 928 apparently can can capture audio up to 140 decibels without distortion, <laughs> which I mean, 140 like a, a jet engine is what 100 decibels or something like that. <laughs> so I don't know what you could possibly be capturing at 140 well, decibels. Uh, exploding that, cars, dude! Come on. Yeah, I mean, if you're, obviously, if you're filming, you were, obviously, you were not bootlegging. Uh, Fast and the Furious 6 with your Lumia 928 as you should have been when you were watching it. Well, see, if Nokia was smart, they would go to Justin Lin, uh, the, the, the director slash producer of Fast 6, who I don't think will be directing Fast 7, but I think will still be involved in some capacity. They should go to Justin Lin and say, hey, look, if you agree to film Fast 7 on the 928, we will pay you a bazillion dollars. Or at least claim and... to film it and we'll fake it. And then... <laughs> <laughs> Burn, burn. Well uh, just, burn. Just to play devil's advocate for the uh, the audio recording, wouldn't it be better performing, say, at like a, a concert? Maybe a lot of people are, are recording yeah. audio yeah. at a concert and, and yeah. doing video clips, and maybe it'll be a little clearer there. Right. I remember yeah, the, no, that's, the that's fair. 808 PureView had the same kind of technology, and it was pretty impressive on that, at least. Yeah, they called it rich recording. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but, I don't know how many people you could use it, but with the 808 PUV in mind, I think 
that is a device that really has the hardware capabilities because it has a really amazing camera. I mean, it's the best camera attached to a phone uh, we've yet seen. That has the capabilities where you can really use it for more serious purposes. Uh, whereas the 928, like Chris says, it has its issues with the camera, with the shutter speed. I don't perceive it as this awesome uh, videographer's device, you know, that you can take out and do something not professional, but more serious than just the conventional pull it out of your pocket and record something, which, you know, Dieter can do with his Via if it actually worked. <laughs> I, you can go ahead and troll the Via, man. I mean, <laughs> Hey, dude, you were four. I, I'm I'm tempted to try and schmooze one out of one of those out of you because I've never handled one of the Vias. I'll send you the one that I was working on last night. How about that? The the my favorite thing to do with the Vier is to hold my hand out like this and then put the phone like right here, and it doesn't reach the extremities of my palm. Yeah, exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> the nice. Vier is a very trollable device. Very trollable. <laughs> um. So is it so no actually the the headphone the, the microphone thing is like a classic Nokia feature in that it's yeah. it's actually pretty awesome um and it's something that once you have it you're like oh this is really great I'm I'm really glad this works so well um but when you go to buy your next phone it doesn't even occur to you to like I must have another phone it's like like Nokia right. makes phones that don't break that have got really good build quality and great reception and like other than, you know, for a few people that are really focused on that kind of stuff, like nobody goes into the store and is like, give me the phone with the best microphone. That, yeah, and, that's yeah. exactly right. It's not a differentiator for anybody. Right. I mean, um, years ago with, with feature phones and flip phones and whatever, dumb phones, it certainly was a differentiator. People would go in and they want the best sound quality because all you could do is make phone calls of the thing. But nowadays, obviously, other features are, are, are much higher priority. Well, so, so I should point out there's one other uh, spec difference with the 928, which is that it, it has uh, an AMOLED display instead of uh, the 920's IPS panel, which is, you know, it is what it is. That Nokia claims that the, they use some term, I think it's superior outdoor viewability, or like they, they have some specific, like, but vague enhancements to improve outdoor viewability of this display, which of course is AMOLED's weak point. And to, to be fair, I took this outside and I can see it very well. Um, so, you know, it made no practical difference in, in the usability of the phone. And I, I, I think that they probably did that. The phone, the, the 928 is only very slightly thinner than the 920, but I think that they still needed to swap that out to accommodate the Xenon Flash, is my guess. Hmm. Yeah, like, they, they needed the additional interior room. Yeah, because the 925, which is the one that got introduced in London a couple of weeks back, is much thinner than both yeah, of them. Yeah, let's talk about the 925, because Chris and I actually both got our, a chance to, to touch one and handle it last week. Uh, and, and Dieter, did you as well? Yeah, briefly. Yeah. So, so we've all touched it, and, and frankly, uh, when we did our hands-on with, um, with Tom, I believe, did it uh, in, in London, he, he said it was the best-looking Windows phone was on too. the market. And Vlad was there, of course. Uh, the best-looking Windows phone on the market, and uh, I totally agree. Like, it, it seems like you know, the execution of Nokia's design strategy, for a long time I've said the N9 has kind of been the pinnacle of that, but I think that the 925 really modernizes that design uh, and, and does a great job of blending the... Uh, polycarbonate back with the aluminum rim, and it's nice and thin, and it feels you know great to hold. And and you know, frankly, I think it's a, it's a beautiful design. Yeah, the 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 matte finish on the polycarb back on the 925 is super yes. deluxe. Like I yeah. I would definitely not hesitate to own this phone if I had one compl well two complaints. One, the seams are a little thick and out of place. That was, maybe that was my problem. Is the seams are a bit much. But I mean, other than that, I got yeah. no complaints. Yeah, my other complaint is the, um, and Dan, you and I talked about this, the snap-on back for Qi right. compatibility. Nobody is going to use that thing. Yeah, just don't well, use no, it. No, no. Don't even do it. I take that back. Everybody is going to use it because whenever I'm in public, it strikes me how 99.5% of the population uses a giant clunky case on their phone. So right. actually everybody will have that, that back <laughs> attached to the 925. What's funny is uh, it's the same concept that's used on the 720, but the 720's case actually like kind of, covers the whole phone. It looks like it's part of the phone. It just makes it thicker. Whereas the yeah. 925s just grab the corners and it just looks so bolted on and it just it, 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 it just ruins the design of the entire thing. Right, right. Yeah, there's no reason to be using... Is there a micro USB... There must be a micro USB port out, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah so there, there's no reason. I mean, I, just, I would just treat the phone as not having Qi. 
basically. Well, he doesn't. <laughs> right, not without, the, yeah, not without the, not without the sleeve. So I, I would uh, the other phone, the other Nokia that we got a chance to see there was uh, Dan. It was the six twenty, right? Yeah, the the double shot model. Yeah, I I want them so badly to make a high end double shot phone, and it that feeling was only reinforced for me after I saw the six twenty in the flesh because it is so freaking cool to have these two uh, completely different bright colors of plastic laminated against one another. It just looks awesome. Yeah, I think the one that we saw was for the new prepaid company, AIO or or whatever. Like, it's custom built for them, uh, and it was purple on the outside, and then the the double shot interior color was like this this neon pink, and it just looked really, really sweet. Yeah. So, So, do that on your high end. All of our analysis is really just how sweet does it look? (laughs) <laughs> hey, that's well, a you know enough, first impressions, man. Like well, that's I mean, all we can get with those. Phone, right? That's yeah, since they, they don't get to customize, that's about as far as you can go sometimes. Well, uh, uh, although, uh, yeah. go ahead. I mean, I was going to say the nine twenty five. At least the units that I had had uh, the double tap to wake on yes. the screen, which is like oh, my right, favorite yeah. feature from the N nine. You could just tap on the screen twice, and it wakes the phone up. Is well, aren't they also doing the um the with the screen off the the shows the time without taking up much power have they brought that back yeah, I don't think had. so no? um, okay. I don't know if it's on the road do with the new AMOLED display because yeah. yeah that's that's the one that facilitated it with their older models but they haven't done it yet yeah it'd be yeah. great it, if they it seems that. to be the case that Nokia I mean the other thing is that uh, the Asher 510 also has the uh, double tap to wake right. Nokia seems to be, seems to find it easier to port things over to it's Azure platform, the Windows Phone. Every time it, it brings an old Symbian or Mego feature over to Windows Phone, it's like a massive achievement. It's like, yes, finally, <laughs> brush the sweat off you, off your brow. It's like we got something done on Windows Phone. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, yeah. double tap to wake is a really awesome awesome feature. We I've I've been fawning about it for so long, um, but I mean, it's it's just kind of like putting a cherry on top of a non-existent cake with Windows Phone. <laughs> well, here, here's one question that I didn't think to ask Nokia, and maybe one of you guys has the answer to this. With Double Tap to Wake, if you have uh, if you have the screen set to high sensitivity mode and you keep the phone in your pocket, is it going to brush up against like your like the lining of your pocket and then detect your your like leg and turn on? I, I didn't ask, that's a very good question to ask, and I, I didn't ask, but when I was using the phone to do activate it, you had to give it a good solid tap, like repeated tap. Yeah, um, but keep in mind that I think all Nokia phones, including this 928, uh, they come, they ship in non-high sensitivity mode, so the, the 925 might just have been in, in the default mode, which, you know, doesn't true. detect, it is in glove mode. So, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, the other thing. I guess oh, one other thing about the 925. Oh, Let's just turn this into a Nokia podcast. Yeah, true. that's fine. Going all the way. I, I don't <laughs> want to talk about uh, anything else. <laughs> uh, one other thing that that is interesting about the 925. You know, both the 920 and the 928 are are uh, really trumpeted as uh, imaging phones with really good cameras. Like I, I said, they have the the pure view branding, and the 920, of course, has the Xenon flash, which is a pretty rare feature. But Turns out the 925 actually has the better camera because it has a um, it has a six element lens. Lens, yeah. Whereas the 920 and 928 have five elements. Yeah. Which again just says Nokia has the same old story going on. Lots of little hardware additions and good things. It's just the software never catches up. Right. Uh, but but since we're talking about how things look, uh, let's quickly switch over to LG. Uh, which uh, just announced the Nexus 4 in white. Yeah, that's going on Finally. sale tomorrow, but only in Hong Kong, and then the coming weeks for the rest of the world. And so it is actually pretty sexy. It's pretty good this, looking. This thing leaked like back in January, right? Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, a long time ago. It would have been relevant before I/O. Now I could not possibly care less. <laughs> Like seriously, I mean, like who who's gonna buy this over a Google Edition One or GS4? Let's be real. Right. Well, and I don't know. Have we talked about the rumors that the? I mean, they they were. Uh, it was first on Geek.com, and then CNET has confirmed that the one is also going to get a, a Google Edition stock device in addition to the right. S4. Yeah, I I don't care about the white Nexus Four at this point at all. Yeah, I want to. I, I would have three months ago, but not now. 
Even the then, I don't know. Happy. I don't think it looks that great. I'm a sucker for white phones, and I really am not a fan. I haven't seen this in person yet, so, you know, reserve final judgment. But from the pictures I've seen, a bunch of people have gone hands-on with them and things like that, that uh, around the web. And, you know, meh. Uh, no, I, I saw it at I.O. Uh, Taylor, Taylor Wimberly from Android and me had it, and I took a look at it, and, it, you know, it's a white Nexus 4, yo. It's got, like... <laughs> Like the, the the plastic rail around the edges is kind of I don't know like pearlescent. It's got a little bit of depth to it, um, and then you know it's got a pattern back, and it's it's a white Nexus Four. We um, really should not be ever having to use the word pearlescent when describing phones, <laughs> particularly you know, phones I mean, that men are expected to use. And this is just especially with plastic LG. Yeah, I mean, I mean I LG know, and look, Samsung have been guilty sparkly? of doing this. Yeah, I mean, still bad. Vlad, Vlad I, I take I take issue with your sexist comment. I will say that I am in the <laughs> in the process of ordering a pink uh, Casio G Shock uh, to add to mm -hmm. my my watch collection, uh, and and I am not the least bit uh, insecure about it. And you should not feel insecure about using a pearlescent phone. Not now, not ever. I'm putting my foot down. Didn't Audi but, make some great pearlescent paint finishes, like pearlescent white? I believe they did. Uh, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. But it looks right. cheap. Okay, let's, take, let's talk take about away my Google sexism. It just looks cheap. <laughs> yeah, I'm not <laughs> arguing with you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to buy one. That's for sure. Let, okay, let's talk so, about. So go ahead, Dieter. I'm sorry. I was going to say. So real talk. We have got uh, rumors that we feel pretty confident about of the HTC One coming in stock, and we've got the Galaxy S4 coming in stock for sure. It was announced at I/O. Um, what are you guys going to do? <laughs> we so, Dieter, this? I you feel like are we talked about it last week. <laughs> Dieter, you, you are a terrible human being, and I'll tell you why. Why? Uh, because I, I was 100% convinced that I wanted the one, and then you were like, well, no, but wait. And then you listed <laughs> off like 10 really good reasons why, why it's, the decision is not clear-cut, and now I don't right. know what to do. Oh, we definitely talked about this last week because I, I, I mentioned I was putting my one up on, on eBay. I mean, All right. look, uh, if... If the one has the same uh, ultra pixel camera module in the stock, I doubt that the stock camera software can do what it needs to do to take a great picture relative to what HTC's Sense Image Magic chip blah blah can do. Um, and you know, battery life just isn't that great. So I, I'm leaning S4 right now. I'd also really love to know how they handle the button issue. Uh, with stock right. Android. Do they do the menu button on screen? Do they repurpose one of the capacitive buttons? Do they turn on the HTC logo, which happens to, for all intents and purposes, has a capacitive panel below it? Um, you know, how so is that going to be sorted out? These are all really good questions. And also, like, on the GS4, uh, is, is, the, is the eye tracking sensor just going to be completely disabled? Like... You know, isn't that like just, there's all this is, hardware that is. Is that a special sensor it. on the four? Yeah, I was gonna say. I, I thought that was just the using the camera. the camera. Yeah. yeah. No, there's there's if you look at the front of the GS4, there's an additional sensor that isn't present on the GS3. Um, Does it detect I, the life in your eyes? Like a zombie <laughs> wouldn't be able to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it automatically uh, calls nine one one if it detects that you're dead. Yeah, um, no, no eye tracking for Dracula. Sorry. There, it's it's either the, the, the extra sensor, I, we could get this answer from, from Samsung very easily, but the, the extra sensor is eye, either eye tracking or it's a, it's a sensor for like the, the hand wave, uh, which is also possible. But the, they're doing something, maybe it's a 3D thing, like a Kinect type of thing, but they're doing something more than just using the front camera for that stuff. Speaking of extra sensors, has anybody yet figured out a way, a useful way to exploit the barometer in the Galaxy S4? Uh, yeah, there's actually this uh, weather app. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, hang on, let me let hey, me what it's called. Look, right I got now. to talk about WebOS. Chris has got to talk about Fast and the Furious. Dan is now <laughs> speaking about weather apps. Vlad, you so, really need to take like 20 minutes about some personal. There's this there's this weather app uh, called Weather Signal, which is like a uh, really um, it's a crowdsourced weather app that takes the sensors on your phone and uh, determines that your current weather conditions based on temperature, barometer, whatever sensors your phone has, it can access them. And then uh, it kind of crowdsources them. So if a lot of people use it, they gather the data and then they can give a, a weather report for a certain area. So yes, that's one way to use the barometer on your Galaxy S4. Good. Using weather Good. signal. 
just to bring us back to Dieter's question earlier, where he was saying, what are you guys going to do between the GS4 and the 1? Um, my answer would be one of two. I mean, one might be, I'm not going to be buying an Android phone, is one, right? Or alternatively, if forced into it, I will buy it first, which uh, also has stock Android. It's stock like Android 4.1. Yeah, but you can't do that in the UK right now. Yes, but I can't do it in the UK because HTC is just determined to complete the suicide mission that it's on right now <laughs> and just decided, no, we have made this phone which people have been begging for for so long and now we're just not going to sell it in the UK. Well, I mean, apparently it's Facebook's phone, but honestly, I mean, here's the thing with HTC. They've been bundling a lot of things and, and I know it's really easy to bash on people when they're down, but let's just remember when the HC1 was introduced and how they tried to do two simultaneous launch events and how the New York HC1 presentation where we had people was about 20 minutes ahead of the London one and we were trying to live blog this in some sort of coordinated fashion and it's like this guy is talking about the ultra pixel camera and then this guy is talking about the aluminum finish and yada 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 it was a mess and and it seems like these things just bubble up to the surface and then combine to make things miserable for companies. I, I think it's, just, it's like a compound issue. But I wasn't really driving at um, hating on HTC here. I just feel like Android phones in general need to give me something more compelling. Um, because of the moment, I agree with uh, the sentiment that a lot of people express, actually, which is that Android is an OS. It's probably the best OS, but the apps are still not as polished as iOS. And a great example for myself was the British Airways app, right? So on iOS, it works. It's a decent. It's a decent application. It's a you know, it's it's a corporate piece of work. It's as good as you get from a big company. It's fine, but on Android, it just feels like completely another garbage. It feels like a web browser from 1997. Well if, if you're on, uh, I, w I flew Virgin America recently for CTIA. Uh, Virgin America doesn't even have an Android app. Uh, and they're, the way they handle with iOS is you can check in on their mobile website and then you click a button to send a passbook and boom, your, your mobile boarding pass is sent to your passbook and you don't ever have to load the mobile website again. Right, and people like EasyJet and Qantas recently got involved with passbooks so it's not that completely deprived as usual. But it's just you know, I, I kind of feel like, um, I wouldn't say we're stagnating in terms of software, but the development and the progress isn't as fast as it used to be. I think we can definitely say that. And just, just to score a nice and quick uh, segue here, we can talk about the next iOS, which is supposedly a massive redesign. Flat. We've been hearing this flat thing forever and ever. Now we've got a new report that he's going to get rid of heavy textures for a flat black and white design as according to 9 to 5. Um, I mean, at this point, if we don't see... Um, it seems to me like, like uh, you know, last year with iOS 6, they all they had time for was maps. Uh, this year, we know they can't do everything. So, like, I want to see a redesign of the, the core launching experience, the core apps, and some improvements to the notification center and that's yeah. that's enough. If they do that for iOS seven, I'll be very happy. Uh, I'm not expecting. I'm not. But but that you, you make it that sound more. like a small. You make you make that sound oh, no, like yeah. a small deal. And it like what you just described is like basically completely flipping the the platform on its end. And I don't. You know. I mean, Apple's a big company, and I I, I don't. No, but I'm not saying they need to like redesign their their like standard button stuff that all the developers use and get for free, right? Like I'm I'm saying just you know take take half of your core apps. And clean them up, and especially game something. Center. Yeah, well, right, <laughs> um, and like that. Fine, cool. That's enough. For well, me. I mean, there's a, there's also a suggestion that it's going to be moving to a more black and white color scheme, which uh, brings to mind the Prada phone that LG did. Oh God, which was all monochromatic and stylish and things like that. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. I mean, I liked it personally. I liked the monochromatic look. Um, but I, I, I'm with you, Dieter. I think uh, if iOS improves just to the point where notification center and game centers start to become things that people actively use as opposed to uh, like 
try and tap something at the top of a, an application and then suddenly drop down a notification center and you're reminded, oh, this thing exists. Ah, uh, it's, that's the utility of it on an iPhone at the moment. Um, if Apple can just, uh, and, and as Chris says, that's not an easy task, but if Apple can just get those basics up to speed and you know, feeling truly modern again, it's going to be kind of an easy choice again this summer. Assuming this summer is when the next iPhone comes out, don't you think? Uh, I could see fall. I mean, I, we're we're assuming it'll be a 5s. You know, it'll be some sort of minor bump on the the five's basic design. So I guess summer is totally feasible. Um, but man, WWDC is coming up fast. We're like two weeks away, right? Yeah, I yeah. think a week and a half or just under two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not ready at all. <laughs> we're gonna see. I, what, what I'm not ready for financially is. Uh, for them to show a Retina MacBook Air. I am not, my wallet is not ready for that. I'm pretty sure that will put half the Verge staff in the poorhouse, like <laughs> instantaneously. I think the current rumors out of that analyst that's always right is that they're, good, they're probably not going to go Retina on the MacBook Air. I'm just hoping for Haswell, uh, the, the new processor. Um, well, that's a given. I was talking, I was, yeah, well, but I'm hoping that they, well, I was talking to Sean about this, about like the possibilities and it, like they could go for speed and not care about battery life. They could go for retina and not care about battery life. Or they could like go just like we've got this new processor to improve battery life. Here are the new here are the new MacBook Airs. That's the one I want. So yeah, yeah I'm I'm really not unhappy with my MacBook Airs performance. Um, I have a 2012 model. I really have no issues as far as you know. It does the things I need it to do. It even runs Photoshop and Lightroom without really any issues. Um, it's plenty fast for me. So if they could just you know double my battery life, that would be a complete win for me. <laughs> That's all, just double my battery life. Yeah, yeah. just no big deal. No big deal. <laughs> because it, right now, it, I get between really like showing two and five showing... hours, which kind of sucks. See, guys, when I was talking about the psychological effects of watching Fast and Furious 6, here it is. Now, like, you, your expectations are so perfectly <laughs> reasonable. Just double battery life. Take iOS and just make everything better, Right. Tick, tick, yeah, we're done. Oh, nice. yes. Yeah. I love yeah. that deal. Make uh, it so, it's easy. Actually, um, to Dieter's point, there is a very good way that Apple can do this uh, that differentiates between the Air and the Pro models of the MacBook, which is to say, okay, you can get a MacBook Pro, which is really thin and all those good things, and has a retina display and power, but you can get a MacBook Air, which is the most amazing battery life. You know, so, so you can differentiate on the basis of the Air's battery life. Yeah. But I was actually thinking about this. Um, the fact, just the way that Windows 8 has become kind of a, a hybrid device OS nowadays. So nobody really sells laptops, just laptops anymore. Nobody sells just tablets. Everybody's trying to do a tablet with a keyboard and a sliding thing and a flipping thing and a something. And I thought, well, Apple is the one company um, that isn't doing this. Like the particular hybrid device doesn't exist in Apple's portfolio. It has laptops clearly de delineated from the iPad. But then I thought about it, and I realized that when you go out and see people using devices, they aren't surfaces. I mean, I always get confused. I see something, and I think, oh, somebody's using actually using the Surface tablet, and it turns out to be an iPad with a third-party <laughs> keyboard. Right. And that, that's the thing. That void in Apple's portfolio is being filled by third parties, people, you know, dishing out the accessories, stuff like that. I, I wonder. Okay. I, I don't have the statistics on this, but I really wonder if uh, the third-party keyboard manufacturers um, that make the keyboards for iPads have sold more units than Microsoft has sold at the Surface. I would That's guess yes. That's a very good question. I wonder what the numbers yeah. are like. That's a good bet. Um, man, we were just burning through topics. Um, we're very efficient. This oh, episode. okay. You know, one more thing. Um, and then maybe we can wrap up. And I, I know that somebody, uh, probably Dan, wants to go on a screaming rampage about this. Let's talk about this uh, administrative fee that AT&T is adding to the bills. <laughs> somebody explain this to me. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take a stab. So um, AT&T announced, or it became, it became news or it became known that AT&T was adding this uh, 61 cent, I believe it is, uh, fee to their uh, monthly bills for every single user on every line that they have. Um, start. I think it started in May 1st. Um, right. so, so every month from here on out, if you have a line with AT&T or more than one line, you have to pay another 61 cent 
per line fee um, on top of your rate plan and on top of your regular taxes and government surcharges and all that stuff. So 61 cents, it's like, okay, whatever. It's like seven, eight, it's eight bucks a year. I am like, I, I, yeah, I but that's not get, the point. Okay. Yeah. Get me worked up about so, 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 one cents so a, a month, please, please. Go for it, Chris. Cause you look like you're about to <laughs> look, look, okay. The, the, the point is that a carrier, I mean, take the, take the number out of the equation. The issue is that a carrier has arbitrarily chosen uh, without, you know, invalidating ETFs, without really anything, just uh, arbitrarily decided, okay, we're going to charge all of our customers another sixty-one cents a month. And uh, oh, so you know, there wasn't a like, oh, you can. This is this is one of those things where we change your contract and there's a backdoor way no. for you to get out of your early termination. Right, fee right Dan, to. it doesn't apply here. Is no, right? from my understanding, uh, because this does not uh, change your your advertised monthly rate plan, which say is like. Thirty nine ninety nine a month because it's a a fee that's added after the fact. It does not materially adversely or adversely change that to a material effect. Whatever the wording is that lets you get out of your <laughs> wow. contract without an ETF uh, does not apply here. Um, so it's not one of those things where you can get on the horn with customer service for six hours to try and get out of your um, contract if you're looking to leave AT and T. If, if the FTC was doing its job. They would say, "No, AT and T, you are not selling a fifty nine ninety nine rate plan. You're sell you're selling a sixty dollars and sixty cents rate plan. Like yes. that's that's what should be on the sign. Like yeah. I don't understand why this is okay. <laughs> no, so, by the way, by the way, not, we shouldn't single out AT and T right, here. Yeah. They, other carriers have been doing this for years. It's just it, it's been brought to light because AT and T just added this. It's okay. it's. It, Go ahead, Just bud. before Dieter bursts out laughing at whatever he's looking at his No, brain. I was sneezing. I was sneezing. <laughs> oh. You don't sneeze into your hand. You sneeze into your sleeve. It's more sanitary. You can, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a thing. I believe. I'm with you, Dieter. Dieter, uh, just a heads up. Your hands are washable. <laughs> So oh, it's my sweater. I... Uh, okay. No, I mean, I was outraged about this from across the ocean, about the at and administrative fee. I mean, I just thought it was completely arbitrary and random and annoying. But Chris's point is a very good one. You guys have already signed the contract. You've agreed a deal. You've set out the terms of that. And now at and is just completely... I mean, it's subtly changing it. It's changing it by cents. Um, I guess well, part of the contract the with of nickel and diming you. Part of the contract with telling AT and T, yeah, go ahead and change it whenever we don't care. So the the thing is, like, uh, you know, we said, it, don't forget about the dollar sign because it's the principal. But when you think about the dollars, it's very minimal right now for a person with one or two lines. Uh, if you have five lines, it starts to becoming a noticeable cost, maybe. Um, but it is adding a significant amount to AT and T's bottom line at the end of the year. I think it's between five hundred and six hundred, or, or even more, million dollars a year that AT and T can bring in. And then the other concern is if they're able to add this fee without really any recourse, without, you know, letting people get out of their contract or without having a huge backlash or without a, a, a complaint from the government, who's to say that next time they're like, oh, uh, these administrative costs have gone up to $5 per line per month or they've gone up to $10 per line per month. And now well, that, you've that, got a thing. significant change in your monthly cost. And, you know, it's, it, there, if this sets the precedent where it doesn't matter, who's to say that doesn't happen? Dan, that, that's... No, I mean, I am to say. I, I'm telling you right now, it's not going to happen. Uh, well, you know the apocryphal tale about how you stick a frog in cold water and then gently warm it up and it won't jump out, right? right. Um, I think people have actually done the research and found that if you gently warm it up, the frog eventually realizes it's boiling and leap out. Uh, but besides that, that's exactly what these carriers and what these corporations with too much power, and this is the important thing, if there was competition, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Right, because if AT&T just decides we'll be more expensive, uh, it automatically makes itself less competitive, and the next round of people upgrading is just going to see them lose customers. So ultimately, AT&T is shooting itself in the foot. But being a duopoly with Verizon, it's like 
either I go with these well, douchebags or I go with those <laughs> douchebags. So he's like, you're stuck. It's it's interesting. You know, we talk about Verizon because Verizon has an administrative fee as well. I believe it's 99 cents per line per month for Verizon. Uh, but they've had it for a long time, so we're not talking about them just adding it. But what they did try to do recently uh, within the past year is add a $2 per month fee if you tried to pay your phone with a credit card. Um, which they added and then quickly retracted when, you know, everyone threw a stink about it. So, you know, if enough people are going to complain about it, you know, it eventually becomes bad enough press where it's not worth the 61 cents per month. Um, but, you know, it, I, don't, I don't know if we're quite at that point for but AT&T that's to retract the trouble. I don't, think, I don't think we should, uh, we being the American people, uh, which I'm joining in with, in a case of uh, international solidarity right now. I don't think that people should have to organize themselves in bunches and millions and you know occupy AT and T just to get sixty one. You're, you're, you're totally totally bill. right. And that's to Chris's point earlier, because if the FTC was doing its job, then we wouldn't have to. But you right, know, exactly. it seems like it, these companies can just roll over uh, or steamroll over uh, and do whatever they want without really any recourse from the FTC saying, I mean, no, that's just, really anti-consumer. The re- yeah, exactly. And, and the really annoying thing about it is that there's massively unequal bargaining power. As I say, as somebody who wants to have reliable connectivity and who wants to have a LTE and who wants to have the latest phones and all of that stuff, you're really stuck with just a couple of choices. Right. Um, whereas AT&T is the company that gives you terms and conditions that, go, that run on to like a dozen pages and things like that. Uh, so when the bargaining power is so unequal, you can't let the person or the party that is in the ascendancy in that relationship just spring some extra costs into it. And particularly when all of us know that AT&T and Verizon have been rolling in profits and raising their ARPU, average revenue per user, ARPU. regularly. So it's, it's not like these guys are struggling. It's not like they're going bust and we need to help them out and help out the American economy in that way. No. Yeah. Not, not in the least. Furious, it's inter- it's interesting to see that um, the only options that you have if you want these things of like reliable service and LTE and things like that are really for most people uh, AT and T and Verizon. Because when AT and T was trying to buy T Mobile, one of its main arguments was that we're not a du- It's not going to be a duopoly because most markets have you know five different carriers available to the consumer. But in reality and in practical terms, they don't because those three other carriers either don't have the same level of service, don't have the same speed of service, don't have coverage, uh, don't have, you know, current generation uh, 4G wireless networks. Um, So, yeah, you are stuck between, for most people, you are stuck between the two largest carriers in the country. Here's how this is going to play out. Like five or seven or ten years down the road, you're going to get a little postcard in the mail that says, congratulations, you're part of a class action lawsuit. And... And the class action will win, and your prize will be a, a, a like a a calling card with five minutes on it. Like <laughs> yeah. that's how this is going to play out. Meanwhile, you're still paying sixty one cents per line per month th- for the end of time. Right. Great. <laughs> the, this is really depressing. I'm going to end the moment show right now. <laughs> Do you um, know what would be depressing is if you're yeah. stuck in some like two-year long contract with like a pre-free or whatever and then they spring this on you and you're like why does the world hate me wait are is there such a thing as somebody on a two-year contract with a pre-three right now no well uh it never retailed at at&t germany sold in germany i don't know if they've ever sold on contract it must there are definitely still human beings with pre-twos on contract i bet oh yeah Ooh, that's sad Man. Well, guys, we'll be chipper <laughs> next week. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching the Virgin Mobile Show. Apologies for the technical difficulties at the beginning. If you follow, if you if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can and should. I am Backlon Vlad is Vlad Sabov. Dan is DC Seifert with an EI. Chris is Zed Power. Uh, we are all at Verge. And you can leave a comment on this post, which is up now. And you can also post in the forums. Uh, we like GIFs or GIFs. And uh, we'll be back oh, soon. One last point. We have one a last new point. headline picture for our post. Yes. yes. How did we, we not couple. talk about that? Oh, my God. Okay. I'm we, finally we a, a couple... real person. 
You are welcome, <laughs> welcome to the head image, Dan. Congratulations. Uh, there's a couple, and we'll be we'll be switching between them. Um, each, they all look really one, cool. Yeah, each one uh, flatters a different one of us uh, in turn. So <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Um, goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching.